Everybody's real quiet, so I'll call a meeting in order. I appreciate y'all's patience. We're a couple of minutes late getting started. Uh, the first item on our agenda this evening is to call our meeting to order and establish a quorum. Uh, we do have a quorum of our board team members here. Mr. Hernandez is not here. I was, I'm anticipating him being here, but he is not here uh, as of yet. Um, our next item, item two on our agenda, is our invocation. We're honored this evening to have uh, Jared Gray. He's the youth pastor at San Angelo First Assembly, a former student at uh, Central High School, and someone that stuck around here to do to take care of our youth. So we appreciate you being here, and we'll let you lead us in our prayer this evening. So let's bow and pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for the opportunity we have to be here. And what an honor it is, Lord, to serve um, in the capacity that we do for students across this great city that you've placed us in. Um, Lord, I pray that you would continue to give wisdom and guidance to our board, our, our, um, our teachers, Lord, our faculty and administrators. God, that you would guide them and give them wisdom to make accurate decisions, Lord, that you would have them to make to guide the minds of the next generation. Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless our schools, that your hand would be upon them, you keep them safe. Um, Lord, as we go throughout the rest of this school year, I pray that your favor would be upon us, Lord, that you would keep our students safe and in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. We appreciate that very much. Next, we have our pledges. We're honored this evening to have some students from McGill Elementary um, School. And we have Wayne Davis, who's in the first grade. And we have Harmony Little, who's in the fourth grade. And we have Ava Claire Lara. And I'll ask them to come forward and lead us in our pledges. And if any of the parents or folks that came with these young folks would like to take a picture, let them come back and stand up there and y'all can take a picture. Thank y'all. Thank y'all for being here. Next up is item four on our agenda is recognitions. Um, we're going to recognize um, virtually some of our students at Central High School. And um, Fair, are you going to do that, Rodney? Uh, okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Rodney uh, Chance, our executive director of athletics, and he's telling me that Farah's taken care of it. So we'll let Farah, we'll turn it over to Dr. Gomez. All right, good evening, Mr. Lehman, Dr. Detloff, and members of the board. Actually, I'm simply going to pass it over to Coach Davis. Who, Coach Davis, now remember I told you that you are featured on the TVs here in the boardroom. So I am giving you that disclaimer. And also to our viewers who are joining us um, by TV, we are also live streaming on Facebook right now so that our families and our student athletes can be watching the virtual recognition. So we're very excited to have Coach Davis and to hear about our Central High School uh, football team this evening. So Coach Davis, we're gonna turn it over to you at this time. Let's try again. Let's see if you can hear me now, Coach. Yeah, I got you. Okay, here we go. <laughs> We're going to try that introduction again. Let's see. 
We might have had some technical difficulties. All right, we'll give, we'll give another introduction for you, Coach. So right. uh, you might not have heard Mr. Lehman there. So Mr. Lehman introduced Coach Chant, our Executive Director of Athletics. And I said, actually, well, Coach Chant pointed to me, and I said, actually, I was simply going to turn it over to you, Coach Davis, to recognize right. Central High School's football for your performance this fall semester. And we're happy to have you and hear more about your fall season. Okay. Uh, uh, do I just like let you know that we need to go to the next slide when, when I need to? Absolutely. Okay. We're ready. There's our team uh, uh, picture from this year from the two thousand or the 2020 Bobcats. Uh, you know, I thought we were had a great year. It, we overachieved, really. We had a, a ton of adversity. Not, you know, we had the same adversity a lot of teams had, but we also had to start uh, with three games on the road against really tough opponents, and and uh, I think it made us a lot better football team. Uh, but it also uh, was a tough road, you know. And I think it kind of made us tired too, to where at the end of the year, you know, with with some other issues that we had, it didn't finish the way we wanted to, but. I'm very proud of these guys. You know, they they persevered and overcame a tremendous amount, uh, and uh, it was a joy to coach them. The uh, the superlatives that we have for this group will be the next one. Maybe one more forward. Okay, here's some of the the things that were accomplished. Uh, we had uh, we won by district, and then we had uh, several that were all all uh, academic, all state. Uh, we had nine. We had uh, six. Uh, maybe it's going through them like that. I'm sorry, but it's uh, we had six school records broken, uh, and then we had 11 uh, consecutive playoff berths. So you know we're very proud of that. This group's very proud to have been a by district champion. You know they weren't a district champion, but they were a by district champion. So first time we won a gold ball in a couple of years. So, I'll, you know, we we're excited about that. And then the all district selections will be the next one. 22 all district uh, honorees. Uh, those, those 22 honorees are uh, quarterback Malachi Brown, wide receiver Seth Levesque, uh, wide receiver Jalen Lifefesty. Do we have pictures of these guys or is it just this? Cause I'm not positive about that. There we go. Caden, uh, Caden Box was an honorable mention all district. We can just slide through them there. Uh, Malachi was academic all state and offensive MVP uh, of the district. Joseph Canava was academic all state. Ty Casey was first team all district uh, outside linebacker. Aureli uh, Sedeo was academic all state. She's one of our, our uh, football operations. Montavious Dobbins was second team all district. Caden Hammeister was honorable mention all district. Ashton Hartsfield was first team all district punter and honorable mention on defensive tackle. Malik Haywood was honorable mention all district at uh, wide, well, at defensive back. Tyler Hill was second team all district uh, receiver. Weston Hill was an honorable mention all district receiver. Dwayne Huff, uh, first team all district defensive tackle. Will Jost was a, a academic all state. Jalen Lifefesty was first team all district uh, inside receiver. Seth Levesque was a academic all state and also first team all district wide receiver. And Bryson McNutt was second team all district linebacker. Kobe Moore was honorable mention all district and all state hair. That was a joke. I can't hear if you laughed or not, but. Matthew Muncy was uh, academic all state. Chris Munz was first team all district uh, offensive tackle. And then uh, uh, Samuel Navaretti was an honorable mention all district running back. 
Trip Noble was uh, academic all state and also honorable mention uh, all district inside receiver. Jacob Odell was academic all state and also honorable mention uh, all district safety. Cesar Saldana was first team all district uh, defensive end. Eli Salinas was second team all district uh, defensive tackle. And Andre Sanchez was honorable mention all district offensive tackle. Kyson Snelson was an honorable mention all district uh, safety. Mark Wilson was academic all state. And we want to thank you guys, the board and, and our administration and student athletes and especially the parents that allow us to work with your with your youth. And uh, it's an honor for us. It's a it's a great school district. Uh, we love being a part of it. And uh, once again, thank you all for uh, for recognizing us today. Thank you, Coach Davis. Thank you. Mr. Lehman, that concludes Coach Davis's student recognition this evening. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Coach Davis. Our next recognition is recognition of athletic trainers and school nurses. And Dr. Gomez is going to do that for us as well. This group of folks have really had a challenging year, and we appreciate y'all being here very much. to end that Zoom meeting really quick. If you can message Miss Blair, it'll be back up in one second. Ms. Griffin, could you come forward? And Dr. Detloff, could you please come forward? Mr. Lehman, Dr. Detloff, and members of the board. One of our six district goals is to sustain a safe and secure environment because we believe, and research shows, that is how students learn best. As stated in our core beliefs and commitments, we believe in the value of each employee and we invest in highly qualified human capital. Tonight, it gives me great joy to recognize and show our most sincere gratitude to 31 of our most highly qualified and dedicated professionals. Our athletic trainers, registered nurses, licensed vocational nurses, and certified medical assistants are genuinely and deeply committed to the health, wellness, and safety of our students and their families. Over these last 11 months, these professionals have devoted countless hours to the health and safety of others. They have been instrumental in implementing and ensuring observance of our district safety protocols during the COVID-19 pandemic and will continue to do so as long as needed. In addition, beyond the pandemic, these champions for health, wellness, and safety provide care and services to their students. And these professionals truly believe they are their students. They provide care and services to students, and families daily and go beyond what is expected. Some were unable to join us tonight for various reasons and prior commitments. For those present, as I call your name, please come forward to be recognized and accept our heartfelt appreciation. First, for athletic trainers, Central High School, Jenny Corbett. Absolutely. Central High School athletic trainer, Leon Pratt. Central High School athletic trainer, Sarita Ponce de Leon. Our two Lakeview athletic trainers were unable to be here this evening, but we'd like to recognize them. 
Kelsey Vanderberg, and Troy Wildey. And if we could get a picture of our athletic trainers, one ran over here from working an event and has to go back to the game to provide services to our athletes. So Dr. Detloff, would you mind jumping in that picture with them? We want to make sure we're socially distanced and safe. There we go. We are not breaking any social distancing guidelines. Smile through those masks. Thank you very much. Next, we move to our school nurses and healthcare professionals. From Central Maine, Christy Torres. Central Oaks, Dolores Canales. Lakeview and Carver, Cheryl Walls. Glenn, Wendy Palhemus. Unable to be here this evening from Lee, Ashley Springer. From Lincoln Middle School, Sean Godfrey. From Special Education Services, Brittany Hunt. Christy. District wide. Sorry, Christy, I can't read with my glasses on. District wide, and our newest member on our team. No, she's not here. Christy is not here. That's right. I'm looking. You told me, Christy. Well, I still want to recognize her. District wide. She is our newest member on our team. We just got her on board. Christy Petri Petrie. So give her a round of applause. All right. Then moving to Alta Loma, starting with our elementary, Lisa Stewart. Austin Elementary, Selena Poindexter. <laughs> Bel Air and Holloman, Brandy Eisenbach. She's unable to be here this evening. And Tabitha McLaren. We have two for Bel Air and Holloman. Also unable to be here this evening from Bonham, Corey Stewart. <laughs> Bowie and McGill, she had prior commitments as well, Tiffany Snowden. And Charlene Sierra. And for Bradford Elementary, Ginger Hurst. For Crockett Elementary, Crystal Guerin. For Fannin Elementary, she was unable to be here this evening, but let's still recognize Morgan Henry. For Fort Concho Elementary, she's out on maternity leave, but we'd like to recognize Lauren Hahn. For Glenmore Elementary, Don Dusek. She's out this evening. Goliad Elementary, Katie Hemmendale. For Lamar Elementary, Cassie Walden. For Reagan Elementary, Whitney Ramirez. San Jacinto, Roxanne Davila. Santa Rita, unable to be here this evening, Ashley Bates. And our nurse with administrative duties, that means everything under the sun that's not done by these wonderful nurses and healthcare professionals up front, Monica Porras, who also has Crockett and Pays. All right, so Dr. Detloff, find a space up there too. <laughs>
Our next item is item C on our recognitions. I'm going to turn that over to, looks like, Miss Wood. Miss Wood with Molly in the background, Miss yes. Johnson. So thank you. Miss Johnson will be joining me too, okay. special assistance. Um, as y'all know, January is School Board Recognition Month nationally and in the state of Texas. So tonight we honor each of you, although our appreciation extends well beyond this month. Um, on behalf of San Angelo Independent School District, our administrators here tonight in the community of San Angelo, it is a privilege to say thank you to each of you. Lanny Lehman, Gerard Gallegos, Amy Mazel Flint, Bill Dindle, Max Parker, Art Hernandez, we look forward to thanking him later, and uh, Dr. Taylor Kingman, for the critical part you play in fulfilling the district's mission to produce future ready graduates. Thank you for your unwavering dedication to every child receiving a relevant and inspiring education and to ensuring that our students are ready for the world when they leave our halls. At this time, I also invite you to take a look at each of your colleagues and recognize one another for joining you in this journey of service and dedication. You represent different voices and districts and bring unique strengths to this board. And together, you steer the course to stay focused on the best interests of our students. This year's School Board Recognition Month theme as designated by the Texas Association of School Boards, TASB, is navigating to success. When we look at the meaning of to navigate, it seems particularly, particularly fitting this year. To navigate is to plan and direct a route or course, or to sail or travel over a stretch of water or terrain, especially carefully or with difficulty. This school year, the board has planned and directed our district especially carefully and at times with difficulty through the challenges arising from COVID as well as facing and rising to other trials while also identifying opportunities. St. Angela ISD was well poised to take on this unique school year thanks to your guidance and support of safety protocols to protect our students and staff, a virtual learning platform option, the SISD Virtual Academy, and most recently, the community-wide literacy initiative, San Angelo Reads. You are all leaders who care deeply for our community and who invest an extensive amount of your time and talent into the work that matters most for our future, educating our children so they will be the next generation of leaders and contributors to our society. Now we would like to present each of you with a certificate and the small token of appreciation that is already beside you a special gift created by talented SAISD plant science floral design high school students. Um, I'm gonna list their names because they did such a beautiful job and we are so proud of them. I know you all are. Um, Mia Munoz, Anissa, Anissa Garcia, Chesney Trevino, Krishna Castillo, Nevaya Martinez, Alana Franklin, Alyssa Contreras, Sky Luera, Yazel Palacio and Yolanda Ramirez. And um, those boxes that surround the beautiful floral arrangements were also by some of our construction students. So with your support and guidance, San Angelo ISD prepares our students to attain their individual hopes and dreams with the opportunity to pursue career pathways like web development, healthcare, and plant science and floral design. May these beautiful arrangements represent our appreciation and the continuing focus on helping students be prepared for their individual futures. And of course, you can share these arrangements with your spouse or family members because we know that not only does this take your time, but um, it's also their support in letting you come spend this time with us um, every month and more often than that. So when I call your name, please join us in the front to receive your certificate. And then uh, we'll ask you to remain again so we can get a picture with Dr. Deathloff. So. Um, Molly's got the certificate, so we'll be passing those out. So uh, we've got Mr. Gerard Gallegos, board secretary, single mem representing single member district six. <laughs> Mrs. Amy Mazel Flint, representing single member district four. <laughs> Mr. Bill Dindle, who I learned is on the Costa de C board as well, busy man who is our treasurer and represents single member district one. <laughs> Mr. Lanny Lehman, who has been serving for 20 years and he is our board president and member at large. 
Mr. Max Parker, Vice President, representing Single Member District 5. And of course, we're thinking of Art, who he represents our Single Member District 2. And we'll make sure he gets his thank yous as well. And Dr. Taylor Kingman, representing Single Member District 3. Yes, you're in a great spot. So if y'all remain standing and take a picture, Charlene's going to help us out with that. Thank you for your dedication, support, and guidance. We appreciate you so much. Thank you, Mrs. Wood and Mrs. John. Appreciate that. Um, our next recognition, oh, excuse me. That's all of our recognitions. I did forget to read our script, so I guess I could read that now. Um, good evening and welcome. As the president of the Board of Trustees of the San Angelo Independent School District, I'd like to welcome everyone to our meeting here this evening, our regular meeting of the board. I also welcome those of you who are watching the tape of this meeting on our Access Channel 4. Uh, we appreciate your interest in our students. All the items that will be discussed at our meeting this evening have been posted as required by state law. Also, as you may be aware, our board members meet a minimum of two times per month, and most, if not all, the items on our agenda this evening have been previously discussed at an earlier pre-agenda board workshop. As members of the San Angelo Independent School District's Board of Trustees, we're here to set goals, listen to our reports from our superintendent, approve budgets, contracts, and personnel appointments, and to make policy for the school district. Please keep in mind that our meeting is a meeting of the Board of Trustees held in public and not a meeting of the public. However, with that in mind, we have an item on each one of our meeting agendas that allows anyone present who wishes to speak to our board team an opportunity to do so. I'll make certain that we give everyone an opportunity to speak on any item not listed on our agenda this evening. Additionally, prior to taking any votes, I'll ask audience members if they would like to make any comments. Anyone wishing to make comments on any agenda items should do their best to limit their comments to five minutes. In compliance with Texas state law, these proceedings are recorded and will become a part of SEISD's permanent legal record. In order that the tape might adequately reflect these proceedings, I ask that you please refrain from talking while others might be speaking. And I'll ask, also ask as I remind my fellow board team members to please turn off or silence your cell phones at this particular time. Again, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's meeting. To thank you for taking the time to join us here this evening. We appreciate your interest in the activities of our students and the business of our school district. Next item on our agenda is item five, the approval of our minutes. Do we have a motion to approve our minutes? Move for approval. Second. So we have a motion from Mr. Dindo and a second from Dr. Kingman to approve the minutes of our meeting December 7, 2020 and our meeting December 14, 2020. Are there any corrections or comments from our board team members? Any public comment? If not all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, indicate by saying no. Our motion passes. Our next item I uh, just referenced is anyone wishing to make public comments on items not on our agenda. I do have someone wishing to make comments to our board team this evening. Um, I'm not sure what the topic is, but I'm assuming it's not on our agenda this evening. And that's Ms. Cross. So, Ms. Cross, would you please come forward at this time? And thank you for being here. We appreciate your um, you taking the time to join us here this evening. With all the events that have happened in the last several months, I think I would be remiss if I did not address this day in history tonight here with all of y'all. In 1931, our Texas legislator made Robert E. Lee's, birth, birth, Robert e. Lee's birthday a state holiday. On January 23, 1973, the Texas State Senate consolidated the birthdays of Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis to create Confederate Heroes Day, which we celebrate today, January 19th. It's a partial holiday, so state offices are still open, but employees are, can take a paid day off to honor Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, and any of our Confederate heroes. 
Following, I'm sharing some of the words of James Burns, a patriot. Confederate Heroes Day and Robert E. Lee's birthday is today. Today is the day that we honor the men of, of the Confederacy who fought and died during the Civil War, and we are not justifying the evil or the unjust, con, un, unconstitutional practice of slavery. Slavery denied the rights given to them under the Constitution of the United States of America that all men are created equal. But today in Texas, we celebrate Confederate Heroes Day. And on this day in 1807, one of our greatest generals was born and the South's most beloved hero, Robert E. Lee. He was a God-fearing man and well-respected by his fellow men at arms and his foes. We honor these brave men of the Confederacy who died with honor and stayed the course. These men loved their state and their freedom and chose to fight, the Confe fight for the Confederacy to remain loyal to their state. In 1860, men didn't consider themselves Americans first. They were Virginians, Texans, and so forth. So we honor these men on this date to embrace our heritage as proud Southerners and Texans. This is not to say we are condoning the evil of slavery. Slavery is a blot on our Southern heritage and it is to be looked on as the evil and condemnation of our past. But this day is set aside to remember individual heroic and honor Confederate Southern soldiers. Texas isn't alone in recognition of this holiday. Eight other states have similar, similar Memorial Days throughout the year, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, North and South Carolina, Louisiana, Tennessee, and Virginia. And Mississippi and Alabama have a joint Martin Luther King and Robert E. Lee Day. I will always remember Robert E. Lee and our Confederate heroes on this day, and I ask that you join me. If a man throws away his traditions, he had better first make sure certain that he has something of value to replace it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cross, for those comments. We appreciate you being here. Our next item is uh, our report sections of, of our agenda. Uh, first is provided to us each week by Dr. McFarland in our student enrollment uh, report for the 17th Tuesday of school, uh, which was uh, January the 5th. And uh, th I think we're, I don't have that right in front of me, but we're just down about 560 students. We've been really consistent uh, although that's not a great number considering where we were last year, but we're, um, we haven't lost any additional students, and it looks like we're going to kind of level off at that number. Uh, next up is item B, uh, which is update on academic progress, and we've asked uh, Dr. Ritter to uh, take this portion of our agenda. Thanks, Dr. Ritter. Thank you, Mr. Lehman, Dr. Dutloff, and members of the board. And tonight, um, we're bringing to you our Director of Social Emotional Learning, um, Lindy Lyles, who will be sharing with you a report for our academic progress just from the, through the lens of social emotional learning in our district. So I'll turn it over to Lindy at this time. Thank you, Dr. Ritter, and thank you, Mr. Lehman, and thank you, Dr. Detloff and the board for this opportunity um, to talk to you briefly tonight about our social emotional learning initiative and um, just a little bit about how COVID, honestly, as a silver lining, has helped us propel that. So I just wanted to um, start with the fact that I joined the district about a year and a half ago. Um, very, this district was already poised and looking at the, towards the future of social emotional learning. So it was just a huge opportunity um, for me to be able to kind of do what I love. One of the first questions that people ask um, as you start any new job is what exactly do you do? And so, in getting that question, I've had the opportunity to, to talk to people about um, CASEL. It's the Center for Academic and Social Emotional Learning. It is actually a um, national organization that researches how focusing on social emotional learning skills actually helps propel our academic um, skills as well. So they recently broadened their definition um, just this fall to really include adults and then um, the showing empathy for others. So they've broadened their definition for the first time in 30 years, just this fall. When you look at, I am not, um, 
Um, when you look at CASEL, there are actually defined skills that fall under five categories, and there are specific skills in each category. So um, starting with ourselves being self-aware, self-managers, adding to that social awareness, the awareness of what's going on in um, the settings around you, and then relationship skills. And then all four of those categories coming together to build responsible decision-making skills. And in order to get optimum results with our students or as adults, um, the blue circles are all of the environments that really need to align to address those areas. So this is why it's so exciting as we move forward in the future of San Angelo ISD to start looking at what we can do um, to better align those social emotional learning skills for all students. I just wanted to give you a couple of things that we are um, that we have been able to use to help us in our endeavor in building our social emotional learning supports in the district. Panorama is one of those tools that um, began a pilot at least three years ago, a small pilot looking at stakeholder surveys and then also um, surveying students on their SEL skills and abilities. Um, but there's actually three parts of that. We also have the student success platform that's also part of that same company. And so this has just been a huge benefit to have a tool that gives us a way to use data to inform our plan moving forward as we build a more um, aligned plan. I'm not going to go into the data results tonight, but we did have our first survey, stakeholder survey in the fall. We got the results right before Christmas. What I wanted to do tonight is just kind of show you how it gives us such a great visual representation of the data once the surveys come back. Of course, I chose the slide that shows one area just to celebrate um, broadly that our elementary students this fall reported an um, increase in student-teacher relationships, increases in um, positive statements about rigorous expectations, the climate, the culture, and then school safety across the board was up eight percentage points in the elementary. School safety was also up, um, I can't remember exactly the percentage points for the secondary students as well. So I think, you know, as they mentioned earlier, your support on all of our safety protocols really made a difference as well. So it just gives us a nice um, visual representation to start um, seeing areas to celebrate and then areas that we have that we can build more supports around in the future. And that's one side of other side of panorama. And this is just a picture of kind of what a student dashboard would be. It's the student success platform. And this is a little bit different than the survey platform. This actually, thank you, this actually gives us a look at the whole child. So it's having a place to bring in data from multiple platforms. This pulls from eSchool Plus and it pulls in from a couple of other places. And it helps um, teachers and leadership teams be able to problem solve around students' needs very quickly. So as we continue to build this, you'll see that you can pull up a student's dashboard, look at their demographics, you can see how they're doing at each grading period, and it um, helps teachers to diagnose areas of um, extra needed support. So just briefly to mention the red, the yellow, and the green, all of those are cut points right now that are set by Panorama according to national statistics with multiple tiered systems of support. So multiple tiered systems of support being those universal practices that we look at for academics, behavior, social emotional learning, all of that kind of under one umbrella. So that's where um, those, the, the colors come from. And then the last thing I kind of wanted to elevate tonight was just, um, it's been such an opportunity this year coming in looking at something that could help students build skills proactively. And knowing that social emotional learning is going to be a huge focus moving forward as we look at our whole child initiative, as we look at our work with John Tanner and the um, community-based accountability system, 
one of the things that I knew just coming in um, that most districts don't have the luxury of having is a curriculum that actually addresses teaching skills universally to students. This curriculum teaches um, students pre-K through eight. And that, um, something that I haven't said before, was just that that's pretty much where we know our biggest chance for interventions is when they're young. And that by the time they get to high school, we hope that um, we've, if we've done a great job providing that skill support um, intentionally and directly, then as they hit high school, it really is more about um, building into their career pathways, getting credits, and those types of things. So then SCL becomes more of something that's infused into their environment and not directly taught. So with Second Step, we were able to um, purchase those resources for everyone. When we went um, into COVID in March, I thought that we were going to look at a very small pilot but um, when COVID happened, and we know that just in our nation and everything that's happened in the last, I don't even know how many months it's been since March, um, but since March, we know that it's very important that we attend to these needs um, of our students and our adults. And so um, in just sending a text to this leadership team that I've been able to join, it was a very quick turnaround yes, we need to provide these supports. So again, that's something to thank you all for in your support um, for our district because moving forward, this will be something that we're going to be rolling out on more and more campuses. We're going to help them create plans um, to get more and more skill building proactively to our students in the district. And then one last thing um, that goes back to Panorama is all of these companies and all of these programs kind of align. So beginning next year, beginning 21-22, with our student social-emotional learning surveys, we will actually be, um, be able to design a survey to help us gather information to see if our teaching, the second step curriculum, is actually having an impact on those skills. So for example, right now we are surveying students' social-emotional learning skills on um, self-efficacy, and, a, and one other thing, but beginning next year, Panorama is, and Second Step are going to help us align those surveys so that we will have a direct kind of way to bring in evidence to see if what we're doing here with Second Step is making a difference, um, making an impact on those surveys for students. So that's going to be exciting. So that's all I have, just a brief um, introduction, and just thank you for everything that you do. Have any questions? Thank, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Lyles. Any questions for Ms. Lyles? I know you had to present that to us last week, and we asked you to come back and do it again. So we really appreciate <laughs> you doing like that. And uh, certainly good news for our students and uh, gives us good, a good picture of, you know, how our students are performing in a number of different areas. So thank you so much. I will never pass up an opportunity. I think we also have um, an update on our virtual learning platforms that Dr. Ritter is going to ask some folks to come and speak to us about. So. Yes, thank you. Um, we just, we felt that right now it's a, a really good time for us to highlight some of the things that we've been doing virtually in our district. And we had some teachers approach us and say that they were really excited to share with the board some of the, the things that have been positive for them in this experience. And so we agreed, we said, you know what, we appreciate it so much. And so today we have three teachers, um, we're going through the secondary lens tonight. A teacher, uh, English teacher from, uh, from uh, Central High School, Molly Sweats. And we have Christina Garcia from Lakeview High School, math teacher, and Haley Love, who is a digital support teacher from Lee. And so, um, is that it? I'll start. And this is just a quick, just an overview of the two. You've had some questions over time about the platforms that we use in the district for supporting virtual learning of our students. Um, you know, in line with our SAISD mission and vision that our mission of San Angelo ISD is to engage all students in a relevant and inspiring education that produces future ready graduates and our vision is in pursuit of excellence and that is something that all of us helped to develop when we went through our strategic planning and we have our educator profile here and I'll just highlight that right in the center of our educator profile 
we, we want to be safe, supportive, and adaptable. And when we developed that educator profile, we had no idea what we were going to be encountering in the year of 2020 and COVID education, which is a new term for everyone. But in doing so, we know that um, the two virtual platforms of Schoology and Edgenuity that we are using to support student learning, it wasn't just about student learning, it was about student learning, but it was also about supporting our teachers. And that that is something that you as a board and us as district administrators and our campus administrators felt very strongly about as we made some very quick decisions to get rolling at the beginning of the school year. Um, we knew that we needed to have a strong focus on supporting the challenging work of our teachers through this unprecedented era of educating students during a pandemic. And so far, it, yes, it's been challenging, but we can't say enough about our amazing teachers in this district. And so you have three of them here tonight to just highlight some of the positive things that they've experienced through this time. And so we're just so appreciative. We can't say enough. So let's give them a hand. They're awesome. We'll give them a hand again at the end too. So. We so appreciate them. All right, so with this group here, we have, um, let me go right here, okay. So Schoology is the virtual platform we're gonna talk about first, and that is our learning management system that's in place to bridge learning from our school buildings to our students' homes when students have extended absences. So Angel ISD teachers are integrating classroom instruction with Schoology, and our, our teachers who are gonna talk about this today, as I said earlier, Molly Sweats, who teaches English, and she's the department head at Central High School. She's an 18-year San Angel ISD teacher. And Christina Garcia, who is math teacher and department head at Lakeview High School, and she's a four-year San Angel ISD teacher. So I believe Molly is first to come forward and share with us some of the highlights of Schoology. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. I'm gonna to talk to you just real briefly about the practical end of Schoology, and then I'll let Christina, my younger counterpart, talk about more of the um, fun and flashy sides of it. But I'm gonna to talk to you about it as a classroom management software and how um, necessary it is for us to be able to do the things that we need to do with our students who are at home. So I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, the cl putting class resources up in Schoology, about how I deal with absent students, how we deal with quarantine students, and then how uh, Schoology allows us to manage students who have um, accommodations and assign things to them individually. Um, so Matt, can you open up my Schoology? Let's see if it goes through, okay. Okay, I'm gonna show you around my first period just a little bit to show you what I do. So, um, okay, I'm gonna show you my class resources folder first because I was a Google Classroom person and I wanted to um, see if Schoology could imitate what Google Classroom does and, um, and more, and that's exactly what we're able to do. And so, um, hold on a second. All right, so uh, one of the great things that it allows me to do is put every single resource that my students need to access from home, but also the ones who are in class, um, so that when I give them a handout, if they need to access it because they lose it, they can get it via the computer from anywhere and from their phones, which is nice for studying. One of the beautiful things that I can do is I can put up a live calendar that allow. when I say live, I mean that when I make a change to my document in my folder, they see the changes. And so like we scroll, scroll down to week two there and we had an unexpected snow day and I was able to immediately go into this calendar and change that for them and so that they could check it from home. And I had warned them to do that on Friday. We might be having a snow day, so um, look for what it is I'm gonna want you to do so that you're caught up when we go to Tuesday. And so that's one of the nice things that you're able to do with class resources. I also put up every slides presentation, every everything that they'll need from class. Um, and Google Classroom did this. And so this is one of the things I was really glad we were able to maintain in Schoology. But there are a lot of things that Google Classroom could not do that Schoology allows us to do. And so I'm gonna show you right now 
that every week I set up a weekly folder for students who are absent. And so this is this week's. And so you can see that only Tuesday is live because I published it this morning. And you can see the little one under it. And that's because in first period, I only had one student absent. And so I'm able to individually assign that folder to only the students who are absent. And the reason that's important to me is I don't want to confuse my students who are present and they see assignments up in Schoology. I don't want to confuse them because we're doing those things in class. And personally, I don't have them on the computer in class. Um, so, so Schoology is really important to me for the ones who are not in class. Okay? Other teachers use it every day and the kids are looking at their screen in class. And that's a choice. Uh, and that's an instructional choice that teachers have. I just like to be my instruction to not be on the screen. And so, um, but when they're absent, I'm able to individually um, assign them a folder. And it has everything that we're doing in class imitated. Not exactly, because I don't give them quizzes and tests from home, because that would incur just regular absences. Obviously, quarantined, I do. Uh, but regular absences, I don't want to encourage absences. And you can imagine if you were in college, if you could skip on test day and take your test from home, you would have probably chosen to do that. And so I don't encourage the absences by giving them to my students who are just absent, but I do for my students who are quarantined. So I'm going to show you Thursday just to give you an idea of what's in here. So a step-by-step -step of what is taking place in the classroom is, is imitated here in the instructions. And then there's an assignment here to get them ready for their essay test on Friday because they're missing the in-class preparation. And so everything they would need is in there, including links to the rubric and the preparation guide they would need to be ready for the next day. Okay, so if a student is absent, I assign that folder to them. I take attendance while my students are working on a bell ringer. I go ahead and assign this, the folder to anyone who's absent. So it work, can work that quickly. However, for students who are quarantined, I make a separate set of folders. And these folders have a lot more in them because, for example, this is today's folder. It has a video. So during first period, I record myself and I post that video to the folders that have been individually assigned to my quarantine kids. And so they actually see me, unfortunately, every day. You know, <laughs> they have to see me here with my, you know, uh, little mask on, and my little uh, face shield on talking to them. And so, um, but they get exactly what's in class, they get it there, okay, along with all of the instructions that they need to do and the resources that they need to have available to them. And so for my seniors, I record that during first period, I post it during second or in the changeover between first and second. But again, this, this folder is only visible to the student that I assign it to. And so you see the one, I have one quarantine student in first period, and that student is the only one that can see this because it's assigned to them individually. And so I can um, make sure that they get what they need. Um, and one of the ways that I do that, I'm gonna show you, let's see here. I'm gonna show you under, oh, under quarantine, I'll show you on Thursday. They actually have a quiz here that has been assigned to my quarantine students. And I have a student who has the accommodation that she gets extended time. And so one of the beautiful things about individualizing folders in Schoology is that I can go into this student's folder, into this student's quiz, and I can extend the time by half for the student's accommodations which is not something that we could do on other platforms. We couldn't um, give quizzes or tests easily at all on Google Classroom, and we, it was very difficult to individualize. And this one does allow us to follow their accommodations from when they're at home. And so that's a, a really nice thing about this platform. Um, okay, so I will walk you through the basics of how um, we set it up so that it can function for our um, at-home students, both just absent students and quarantine students. What questions might you have for me before I turn it over to someone more fun? <laughs> Any questions, Dr. Kingman? Uh, once quarantine and hopefully is over, you feel like Schoology is beneficial to your absent students just for your normal absentees as well, and it's keeping them progressing throughout the weeks and the days? 
Absolutely. Um, I've found that for school trips now, if I know that I'm going to have, you know, 10 kids out in the speech and debate tournament and there's something that I really need them to hear me say, I post a, a, a video for them also. And so there are times when it's very, very helpful to, we know we're going to have a lot of absences. As you know, the spring, we very often have heavy absences with sports and those extracurriculars, although we haven't had as many this year, but we will start to have more travel hopefully. And when that happens, those kinds of absences, it really will be helpful just to keep this going. You know, we got, we learned how to use Loom last spring, and because of that, now we're finding that we can integrate that all the time. I had a teacher who told me that she, um, on Friday, posted a video, and her students contacted her over the weekend and said, there's no audio on it. And she said, oh, no. But she said, luckily, I had my uh, laptop at home, and I just sat down on Saturday morning and re-recorded it and re-put it up. And those kids did not miss out on that instruction because of that. So um, when we had our virtual Fridays, I was able to teach virtually by video to all of my students in that way. And I just really think that, yes, as we move forward, that using Schoology um, will allow us to continue staying in contact contact with them. There's one other thing that I'll show you, and that's this little um, envelope here in the corner allows me to, uh, my kids to contact me, and I can uh, communicate with them that way. They can email me, they can contact me in other ways, but this way, go, it not only puts it here, but it sends me an, an email immediately and a text alert immediately that I have a message from a student in Schoology. And so I'm not going to miss it. I can go to it immediately and respond to them when they're having um, issues. So it's a great communication tool. Can you access the teacher side of Schoology from your phone as well? I can, yes. It's uh, there, It won't do everything quite as powerfully, but I can communicate with them, post things um, to all my classes that are from my phone. So that's very helpful, yes. Anything else? It does, it does take some time. Um, when we first started, it took more time. We're getting better at it, just like you do anything else. But the setting up of the folders, um, uh, I start working on the next week early in the week. So every time I have a spare time um, after school, during conference, whenever, I go ahead and work on the next week's schedule. Um, and I would say it probably takes me... Um, two hours a week to put up my folders for the following week, two to three, depending on how many um, quizzes or tests or whatever I need to put up for my quarantine students, because those those take time with individual questions. But like I said, I'm getting better at it as I go, and the time is shrinking down as we go. I'm learning some shortcuts. Anything else? All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Good evening. Um, I'm Christina Garcia. I'm the Lakeview High School teacher. Um, so, oops, I did something. Okay. Um, at the beginning of the year, with all the uncertainty um, of how this year was going, um, my coworker and I just kind of dove into uh, Schoology because we didn't know if there was going to be another shutdown or we didn't know how many kids were going to be in and out of quarantine, so we kind of just decided to work solely through school, Schoology. And um, so we kind of just started in July, actually, playing with Schoology, figuring things out, learning, th learning how things work, and we still kind of are learning new things about it. But um, we work completely out of Schoology. Our kids don't ever come into the classroom <laughs> and not get on Schoology. Um, we tried to do kind of a flip classroom thing, but we 
the kids had just came from virtual and they didn't like it, so we went back to in-person instruction and then everything else was just on Schoology. So um, we've kind of learned a, a ton of benefits from Schoology and I mean, I could sit here all day and talk about all the things we've learned, so I'm not gonna do that though. So um, just a couple of, I found three of, that I felt the most important things were and one of them was the automatic feedback. Um, kids like to know exactly what they got on an assignment right away. And um, we try to put all of our assignments into Schoology so that as soon as they hit submit, they know more or less what their, their grade is for an assignment. And we use other programs um, besides Schoology, such as Delta Math, and, but Delta Math is also automatic feedback. And so um, we felt that that was kind of important. And we figured out so many ways to put assignments in Schoology so they're not doing the same thing over and over. And we have a sandbox that we kind of both build out of. And um, we both work at the same time in the sandbox. These are all of our units. We go by unit, not by week or, or month or anything like that. And so I'll just click on a random unit. So we separate the unit into lessons and then each lesson has the assignments on it and um, the quizzes on them. And then if there's an assignment outside of Schoology, they can just click on it and it has the link to the actual um, site that they work on, the, that they're going to work in. And um, they really like that automatic feedback. They like to know that they've got something. I have students that come to me as soon as they submit an assignment, can I do corrections? Because they know that they didn't do so well. So they, they love to be able to have that automatic feedback. Um, the second thing was convenience. So um, we've had kids in and out of quarantine since the beginning of the year. And um, when they're at home, they, have, they, they miss out a lot if they don't have instruction, if they don't have their assignments. And some of them are out for weeks at a time. So when they come back, they're in tutorials for every single class, every single day trying to catch up. And I feel like Schoology has kind of alleviated some of that, that, that lunchtime that they're having to give up to make up everything that they've missed. Um, as Ms. Sweat also said, it can be separated into folders. So just like hers, our, our, all of our units are separated into folders and subfolders and assignments and things like that. So it's not just everything loaded into one big giant folder. Um, and that was one of the downfalls of Google Classroom is everything was just kind of loaded on there and it was very overwhelming. So the fact that everything is organized makes it a little easier for um, us as teachers and as students, as, and for the students. Um, also, as Ms. Sweat said, the students can be individually accommodated whether they're 504 or SPED with accommodations. We can set later um, due dates and things like that. We can modify assignments um, without the other students even knowing that certain kids have later due dates or um, easier assignments or different assignments. Um, so that's one of my favorite things is the fact that we can very easily accommodate students. And then the last thing that I think is probably the most important is accountability. And um, you guys had asked, or student accountability, as you guys had asked if this would benefit after we get out of the whole COVID situation. And I wholeheartedly agree that yes, this is something that we can truly benefit from, especially for kids who are in um, multiple sports, band, um, cheer, and like she said, the debate team, many you know different activities. And I have kids that are gone constantly especially trainers, they're gone sometimes twice a week. So when they're gone, they're not losing instruction, losing instruction because we can easily um, put all of our videos and um, we recently just started doing it a little different, so I'll show you the most recent one. But um, we can easily put our instruction videos on there and the way we started doing it recently was we put it in through Ed Puzzle, so I'm gonna have to actually go to one of my courses. So um, we put the videos in through Ed Puzzle, and the reason Ed Puzzle is great is because it does hold the student accountable. So if um, if we click on the video, 
I hope it doesn't auto. Okay, so we can see that, like I have two students that started the video. They were not absent today. I don't know why, they started, but they, we can see exactly how much of the video they've watched. So if they come and they're like, I, I didn't, um, I need help on this and I don't understand it. The first thing I ask them is, well, have you watched the video? And sometimes they try to get away and they say, yes, I did. So we could easily check to see if they did, in fact, watch the video. Um, so I love Edpuzzle. And Edpuzzle is embedded into Schoology, so they don't even have to leave Schoology most of the time to get, um, to get, on, to get their assignments done. So I really love that we can actually hold the students accountable through Schoology. Um, and it's just, it makes things a lot easier, not, for, not only for me, but for the students as well. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Any questions for? Yes, ma'am. Um, it, it, it does, it has, just like everything, it has its downfalls. So yes, it does because um, we're, we're, it's easier to monitor the classroom because you can clearly see whether or not they're working on their assignment. Um, but it also is its technology. So it's a little bit easier for the students to um, get off task, but it's easily corrected at the same time. So. I know there's, there is a way to do that. I do not do that. I just um, walk around the room and kind of monitor. But I know that there are programs that allow you to see what each kid is doing on their screen. Um, I just walk around because sometimes when they're, when they're struggling with something, they're just sitting there. And it's not because they're not doing anything or they don't want to. It's because they don't understand, but they don't want to ask. So I kind of just look out for those kids um, instead of looking on a screen, because on their screen, it just looks like they're doing nothing. So, yes, ma'am. How many students do you have in your class? Each class? I have a total of... Um, no, just one, one class. One class is about 20 to 25 kids. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate the fact that you walk around and visit with the students. I think that's a... <laughs> Um, they that's actively a monitor so, that that's right. for sure. But thank you so much, Ms. Mark Garcia. Yes, thank you, Christina. And lastly, we have Haley Lev, and she's going to just briefly tell us a little bit about Edgenuity. Edgenuity is our video-based interactive instructional platform that's being used by our students who've chosen the Virtual Learning Academy. As we know, TEA said to us that we had to provide an option for a Virtual Learning Academy for students who wanted to not be coming in person at all. So every nine weeks, we have to provide that option to all of our students in the district. And we started off with um, more students who were in our virtual learning academy, but have gradually kind of migrated back to in person. But we do still have a substantial number, probably about 2,000 students or so, who are in our virtual learning academy across all of the levels. And so Haley is a teacher, one of our digital support, digital support teachers um, at Lee Middle School. And she's gonna talk to us a little bit about what the experience it is for her. So that is her job this school year, is she works and is the virtual learning teacher for those students at Lee. Hello, thank you all for having me here tonight. Um, I would just like to highlight some of the great things that I have seen this virtual learning platform do for our students this year, um, since it has been my world for this last uh, semester and going into this new semester. Um, something I've seen is that our students are developing skills to become the future ready learners that we have in our learner profile. Um, so they are building on their self-discipline, their accountability, and their time management, as well as many other things that um, our middle schoolers specifically, we don't typically see that skill level quite yet. And so for us to watch them and experience see them experience that um, has been very beneficial and it has come from this virtual learning platform that we're using. 
Our students are also advocating for themselves um, a lot when they are in need of assistance or when they are communicating with their teachers. Um, so part of this program is that it is self-paced. So our students are all um, ideally meant to be at the same progress, but because we have students in special populations as well as um, our GC students and our students in the general education, um, they all kind of go at a different pace in this program. So when they are in need of assistance, those students are really advocating for themselves and coming to us when they need that help. Um, so our students Students do have edgenu the Edgenuity program offers messaging, and so it allows the students to reach out to us, and they can schedule times to just communicate with us or even video conference with us, so that we can provide that support that they are in need of. Um, like I said, it does allow our students to work at their own pace. And so something that I have really seen that has been incredible this year is that our special populations are thriving um, in this Edgenuity program. Um, of course, there are going to be those few students that um, may not be working to the potential that they are able, but a lot of our students are using this to their privilege and they are taking this time to really focus on what they need. Since our Edgenuity program offers um, vi instruction videos to them. Um, our students can sit down and take notes as needed. They can also pause the videos. Um, they can rewatch the videos as many times needed so that they can get the information they need to be successful on the platform. It also offers summaries um, and intros, as well as just small assignments to quizzes, um, to projects and unit tests. So our students are not, we're not seeing a gap in our students when they are coming back in person because this program aligns with the TEKS that our students are following in person. So that's something that's been really great for our, um, our kids is that they know that when they're coming in that they are on a very similar if not the same page if they do choose to come back to that in-person learning. Um, our parent-teacher communication as well as our student communication has been so valuable to us during this time because it is really what we um, are having to use while we, our students are in the virtual learning platform. So um, we do keep communication logs where we are constantly in connection with our parents or our students in some way. So whether that means that a student is messaging us daily because they need a quiz or a test unlocked, or if they are contacting us because they need clarification or assistance in an activity, they can reach out to us. But I've also communicated with so many parents on a daily basis because they are curious about what their students progress looks like or they are needing to know what their student needs to do to be successful in this program. Um, so some of the ways that us as digital support teachers and our educators as a whole in the school district are helping our virtual students, um, something we have developed at Lee is monthly newsletters. Um, and so it's very a very simple newsletter, but it's sent out every month to our students to give them the valuable information that they need um, each month to keep them informed about what's going on on campus, but as well of what applies to them as virtual students. So this is our January newsletter, which you'll see there's student and parent information. Um, one of the things that we have recently begun with our virtual learning platform is we have developed Saturday tutorials available for them. Um, and and so that was one of our most important things that we wanted to communicate to our students this month, which is what you'll see up top. Um, and then, of course, we have our important dates. So for example, yesterday was a holiday for our students. So just making sure that they're in the know about that because our students aren't always follow or aren't paying attention to the calendar since they are at home. So we want to make sure that our students have that information given to them directly in multiple ways. Um, and then of course our useful links are what we have kept for our students year round just so that they can benefit from all of the advantages that our virtual learning platform has for them. So um, they are able to see their home access center which allows them to see their grades and their attendance. Um, and then we have also created videos for them that show them um, what is they're capable of doing in Edgenuity. So this is the course map, checking their attendance and their session logs. 
Um, and then of course the student tools, and this is how we are able to offer accommodations for our students in the program. Um, so they're able to have their, um, their quizzes and stuff read to them. They're able to use the notes that they need if that's necessary. So the kids are able to have those tools readily available for them to accommodate them. Um, and then also something that we have um, made sure that our students are aware of this year, and this is something that our educators have really worked to help our students with, is we have requests to see your counselor. And so with our students being at home, we really want to make sure that their social and emo emotional learning experiences are still being valued and seen. So our counselors offer that request to visit with them through video conferencing as well. And so we offer video conferencing. Do you mind going back to the slide? Sorry. Um, we offer the video conferencing. We offer that request to see a counselor in the Saturday tutorials. Um, we also have those frequent parent phone calls and parent emails to make sure that um, our parents are actively involved in collaborating with us as educators to help our students be successful. Um, and then, of course, for our students that we're really working to get um, to be as involved as they can be in their own learning and take that accountability, um, we, off we even have our at-risk coordinator involved with us to do those home visits to make sure um, that our students are being checked on, but that they are just be they are growing as learners. So that's really what our Edgenuity platform is working towards for our students. Um, do y'all have any questions for me? Questions for Ms. Love? Ms. Love, do you feel like Edgenuity itself has been um, ample in responding to you and your needs as a teacher? when you're working with it? Yes, absolutely. Something that's really great about Edgenuity is that it is um, an instructional video-based program. So that is what truly drives the instruction for our students. Um, and so that gives me the opportunity to truly support my students as needed. Um, as a special education teacher in a normal year, that's kind of been what my life has revolved around is being able to support my students in any way that their individual needs may be. So it allows me to do that. Sorry, one more question. Sorry, Absolutely. Yes. Um, and this may be a Jana question too, but as far as, you know, one of the things we've worried about with virtual learning is those kids coming back next year and being where we need them to be. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like through Edgenuity, you'll have an idea of where those kids are falling, where at a time that allowing y'all to intervene during this current year? Definitely. So something that one of the really big roles of us as digital support teachers is we are constantly monitoring our students' progress. So um, we can actually see how far along our student is in each course, and there's even mastery um, rates that are in the Edgenuity program. So we can monitor those to see how our students are doing and what we need to work on. Um, and the way that the quizzes and the assignments are labeled, it actually allows us to see um, to match it up with the teaks and see what they are needing um, more attention to. Any questions? Tyler, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. How many students do you have in the uh, virtual learning Saturday? Is it an average, or do they keep coming back Saturday after Saturday? Or do they? Absolutely. So something that our numbers have fluctuated. However, something I have seen is our number, our kids are very consistent once they've been once. Um, I mentioned that social and emotional learning experiences. I've seen from our kids that they love and they crave that social interaction when they are there in Saturday school so, or Saturday tutorials. So they are there to not only receive the tutorials that they need from a teacher, but to be able to interact with other students in a very small setting, small and safe setting, um, it brings joy to them. And so that's something we've really Really noticed our numbers we kind of see a trend when they are when it's the beginning of the nine weeks and all of the kids are on track there's maybe a little bit of a lesser number but the more that we communicate with the parents and let them know um, remind them that that is what's going on we see an increase in our numbers
Um, our students definitely can communicate between the Edgenuity platform as well as Schoology, but because they are home-based, um, they are not having those social interactions. However, a lot of them are involved in extracurricular activities with the school, such as athletics, band, or choir, and so many of them come for those programs still. Um, no, ma'am, they don't because they're learning from their on, the online program at home. And Mr. Lehman, let me remind our audience that this yeah. is being taped, and so sometimes some of the audio is not coming through. Uh, so I just want to make sure that we stick to the reporting segment. Right, yeah, and I've, I've kind of stretched the rules a little bit because this is a meeting of the public, of the board held in public, and we're asking, we're allowing people from the public to ask questions. So, um, but interesting material and I wanted to make sure that we uh, got as many questions as we could so thank you Miss Love for for your okay, comments thank you. uh -huh. Ms. And I, I wanted to um oh did you have a question oh, I just a comment at oh, the, yes. that, um so, sorry um so I just wanted to first of all thank all three of you for being here um but so I have a 10th grader who um has is um in school and he's you know he's missed a few days here and there um and so we've used Schoology both in school and outside of school. And I have a fifth grader who um, actually did the Edgenuity um, platform for nine weeks. And so I've seen both of these firsthand. And um, I just wanted to um, let you know that, that even my kids have noticed how you, you all and all teachers have, ha have basically had to relearn your profession overnight, <laughs> practically. <laughs> and so I wanted to thank you all for your hard work. And um, one thing, just to answer Ms. Casper's question, um, my my fifth grader, um, her te her online support teacher would actually once a week have a Zoom meeting where all the kids can get together and kind of talk about Schoology or talk about what's going on in their life. And, and my daughter during those nine weeks looked forward to that every Thursday at two o'clock, I think it was. And so there are opportunities um, provided, you know, in some schools, I, I'm assuming it would be harder in a middle school situation, but in elementary school, um, they're doing that. But, but I just wanted to thank you all and all teachers for everything that you do, especially this year. Yeah, and I think we all have to remember that we can't provide everything in a virtual format that's uh, provided in the classroom. And uh, we're required to have a virtual format. We're doing the best we can with that. I think we're doing a great job, but um, the overwhelming majority of this board, and, and I think our um, our community expects students to be in the classroom. So uh, again, we appreciate um, teachers relearning their profession and doing everything they can to make sure they meet the needs of our students. It's been a really challenging uh, half a year thus far, and we uh, we appreciate y'all. Do and um, just to highlight, focusing on our learner profile again. When we developed our learner profile in our district, it was well before any of this happened, but we look at that now and realize just that work in front of that really has helped us to empower our teachers, to provide for our students, to become those communicators, collaborators, critical thinkers, and creators in a way that we never imagined before. The learner profile took on a whole new meaning. Um, but again, thank you so much, ladies. We appreciate your time and your, um, they just really wanted to come forward and share some of their perspective with you from as teachers. Uh, regarding our, our virtual platform. So thank you so much, and we give them a round of applause. We appreciate everything you do, and all of our teachers. I had one more thank comment. You. I had one more comment, too. Oh, yes, sir. I, I, mine was late, but I, I have a, a family of educators, uncles and sisters that were, of course, they're all retired now. And um, <clears throat> we were discussing this here not too long ago by phone, and um, they are very proud of all of you that have had to step up and do this. And, and they've seen this from their teacher friends, how this works. And they were just going, I wish we had had this or this technology back 10, 15, 20 years ago. But they're very, very proud of all these young teachers, all you teachers that have stepped up and what y'all are doing and how y'all are helping these kids and how we're coping with all of this. And they are very, very proud of you. And I'm very proud of you as well. So thank you. Thank you. And um, again, thank you to Lindy Lyles. And you can see how these things go together. We're, you know, with social emotional learning, it's something we're focused on as well. And just all the different facets of our team. Um, we've had a lot of change and challenge this year, but 
a firm foundation for providing for student benefits. So we appreciate your support in all of this and we thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for that report. Our next report is item D in our report section, which is uh, the TAPER report. And we have a public hearing for TAPER. And Ms. Hullahan is going to help us with that. Thank you, Mr. Lehman. For Dr. Detloff. Annually, every district is required to hold a public hearing to report educational performance and the Texas Academic Performance Report, known as the TAPER. The TAPER contains board information, which includes board go goals required by House Bill 3, which is not part of the TAPER. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes and an itemized list of information that is updated or what is not updated information in the TAPER report. So let me give you an example of that. Updated information is our de the school district's demographics, um, college and career, um, and military information, but um, assessment information is not gonna be updated. So that's gonna be interesting because um, some of the information is going to be two, three years old, but some of it's only going to be a, a year old. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. There's going to be under Section 1, your PEAMS Financial Standard Reports. That is 2018-19 um, Financial Actual Report. And you're getting the actual report because we are just finishing up on um, the um, audited report for 1920 right now. Section two is the district's performance report, special education determination status, district goals and performance report. Section three, your campus performance report and goals and the performance objective. Section four is report on violent and criminal incidents. Section five is students performance in secondary institutions. And another piece that's not required in the taper, but I included it in our taper, is college credits earned by San Angelo High School students. And in section um, six, the glossary. So let's talk about district ratings. Due to COVID, all districts and campuses in the state of Texas received the label of not rated, declared state of disaster. And that's interesting because when we talk about the district accreditation status, which includes the accountability rating, they go back two years and use our accountability rating of a B. They use the financial rating A superior from the financial integrity rating system of Texas. The, the, the what's that called? First, yes, acronym, thank you. I was thinking of that word. So as a district, we are accredited. So I wanna highlight a few things. Let's look at some of our, our programs. Our district, with this taper, we had 14,514 students. Our bilingual program, ESL, we had 4.9% of our students in that program. Career and technical education, 9th through 12th grade students only. Of the 14,514 students, 46.3% of, oh, I'm sorry, of our 9th through 12th grade students, 46.3% of our students were in career and tech education classes. Gifted and talented students, we had 3.9% identified as GT. 6.2% of our students were identified as 504. 1.3% of our students were identified as dyslexia. And 10.9% of our students were identified as special ed. We had 57.4% of our students identified as economically disadvantaged. And I'm going to 
not identify all of those, but 0.9% of our students were identified as homeless. 4.9% of our students were military connected and 50.5% of our students were identified as at risk. Our attendance rate for, for the 19-20 school year was 94.9%, which was slightly up 0.1%, a tenth of a percent higher than the previous year, but lower than the state. The state average was 95.4%. Our annual dropout rate was point. One point, I am sorry, I can't read that. Thank you. 2.1%, which was a decrease from the previous year of 0.3%. Again, it's still higher than the state, and we don't want to be higher than the state. Our graduation rate was 93.5%. But it, and, an, and an increase from the previous year of 0.2%. Our college career and military ready graduates was an increase from the previous year of 2.3%. Higher than the state, which is obviously you can see is 72.9%. We're doing a great job there. Our college ready graduates was 63.9%. And our dual credit courses, annual graduates, and this is a yippee, you, I, we are rocking it there, 56.6%, and look at that compared to the state, 23.1%. And that is congratulations to the partnership of Angelo State University and Howard College. And those are students that take dual credit courses at Angelo State University and Howard College. That is both academic and um, career and tech courses. That is an outstanding partnership. Our 2017 graduates enrolled in Texas higher institutions was 47.7%, and at the state it was 53.4%. And what that means is our students are ready to go. We just don't have them going off to a, a university in the state of Texas. Now, that only looks at the state of Texas. It doesn't look at any of the students that go outside of the state of Texas. And we do, I'm sorry, Mr. Lehman, you're going to say it doesn't something. include any that might go in the military either, does it? No, it does not. Okay. No. I wanted to go back to the CTE and dual credit courses because this is the part that I included. And I pulled this right off of um, Texas, the TEA website. I pulled it off of the reports, and it was the last minute thing that I added because I was surprised to find it there. Our total CTE, career and tech education students, earning college credits in 2019-2020 was 2,178 students. In the previous year, it was 2,043 that is 10,481 credit hours. Our total students earning college hours, academic and CTE, was 2,513. That is 9 through 12. College credit hours, 12,191 hours. Think about that. And that just gives me goosebumps. I just have to tell you how far we've come with the partnerships with Angelo State University and Howard. That is unbelievable. I want to talk about, I told you I'd come back to these board goals and House Bill 3. House Bill 3 asks, asks the board and the district to set long-range plans, five years, um, and they ask us to look at three goals and the progress of these goals to report it annually, and that's why I really included it on here, because this is an annual report. 
And the goals must include three. They give you the three goals to look at. One must be an early childhood literacy aligned to third grade star results. One must be early childhood math aligned to third grade star results. And one must be um, college career military readiness aligned to the graduates that meet readiness requirements. It seemed to fit right here. So the three, the three goals that we're gonna look at are the percent of third grade students that score meet grade level or above on star reading will increase from, and of course this 36% was 2018 star results, because that's the last star we had. Now think about that, that was our current fifth graders. We have no third graders in our, school, in our elementary campuses that have taken star for the last two years. It is our current fifth graders. And what we say is that they will increase from 36% to 60% by June of 2025. So it's a five-year plan. Will it happen overnight? No. How will we progress measure that? And what we will look at is our kindergarten through second grade will score tier one. And tier one is, is students on grade level. Um, on an early literacy, literacy childhood assessment, from 64% to 85% by June 2025. Now, where did I get those numbers? Because as I talked to curriculum instruction, and I think Ms. Dr. Ritter left me, but we look at iStation, and we look at um, the next steps in guided reading, and we look at the beginning of the year, and we look at the middle of the year, and what our kindergarten and our first grade are scoring now, and they're scoring at those 64%. And what we want is if our first graders are scoring at 85%, that means 85% of our first graders are scoring at tier one. They're on grade level. So throughout the year, you guys will have um, reports on how our kindergarten, how our first grade, how our second grade are scoring, and that's how we're going to progress measure because that's how we're going to know if our third grade, will, third grade students will get there in STAR. Because if we're not looking at kindergarten, if we're not looking at first grade, if we're not going to look at second grade, we won't know if third grade will get there. You all have put forth the, um, the resources for our students to get there. And we have the instruments to measure them now, which we didn't in the past, but we do now. And you've, you've seen, you've heard Dr. Ritter and her um, um, department talk about that. And so I think, I think we, this is a, um, a good measure to, to um, it's a fair measure, and, and you should be able to see that growth. So in math, you can look to see that, that the percent of third grade students that scores meet grade level or above on star math will increase from 41%, again, a 2018 score, um, to 65% by August 2025. And again, it's going to be whatever measure the state says, they will accept. The reason we did not put a, put a test in there is because the state has not decided what test assessment they would say they're going to approve. They're changing them all this year. And then college career medic, uh, military readiness, we are just saying that, um, that what the percent of college career med military readiness students that meet the threshold for college reg readiness will increase from 61% to 70% by August 2025. And Oh, my mouth is dry. The percent of college career military readiness students that meet the threshold for career and military readiness will increase from 34% to 50% by August 2025. The 60% that came from that goal is that 60 by 30. Do you, do you all know what that is? Most of you know, and that is that by 2030, 60% of Texas between the ages of I'm going to make this up. 25 to 34 will be, help me out here, college or military? Correct. 
college or military or secondary certification. So that's where that 60% that came from. Okay. All right, I want to talk about a few points of pride. We have a lot of points of pride this past year. Um, I want to talk about our bilingual programs. I'm going to briefly talk about bilingual programs at Bradford and Elementary. And if you'll remember, we, we really didn't target bilingual. They just were, were really kind of spread all over. And um, Christy Di Diego, she came and visited. She did a board report for you in November. And we really targeted kindergarten and, and I'm sorry, pre-K and kindergarten. We provide transportation for those babies, and it's, thank you, and it's really exciting. Um, that program is growing every day, and, and this, this coming year, we hope to um, increase it to first grade, so that's exciting. The continuation of our all-day pre-K, um, and as we look at that, and the, hopefully maybe the expansion of that. Thank you. The redesigning of our special education program to meet, meet, to meet behavior needs in the INSPIRE program. Um, increased opportunities for students to participate in PSAT, SAT, and ACT. Partly that is the um, um, paying for students to take those tests, offering those opportunities in school. Um, in the past, we'd have one school offer them in school, the other school would offer them on Saturday. Now it's done during the day, and it didn't happen like that all in the past. Um, I think implementing the second step curriculum, K through eight, that you heard Ms. Lyles talk about today, utilizing the panorama data from staff, student, and parent surveys, the learning management system, the Schoology that you heard the teachers talk about this evening, the universal breakfast district-wide. This is the first year that that's happened. That's exciting. We've, we've talked about that for about 10 years now. The partnership with Angelo State University and Howard College. Of course, the, the partnership with Shannon Medical Center with the Shannon Telemedicine. That's, um, that's been big and then the many, many, many partnerships that we have within the community. There's too many to name. Information on the, on the taper report can be found on our website or in, once we post it, it'll be posted by the end of this week, um, or it can be found on the TEA accreditation status website. So our website, it will be www.saisd.org. With that said, do I have any questions? Any questions from Ms. Hallahan? Thank you. Thanks for that report. We appreciate I'm that. I'm sorry, it's long. It's okay. All right, I think we can get through our agenda pretty quick, so let's not take a break. Item 8 is our consent. Items A through E, do we have a motion to approve? Motion to pr approve consent items A through E. Second. We have a motion from Dr. Kingman, a second from Mr. Parker uh, to approve our consent items. Consent item A is to consider donations to the district. Uh, those are in our board packet. We appreciate those who have um, helped and made donations to the district. Item B is to consider bid number 20-013, uh, which is for miscellaneous supplies. Uh, can, item C is considered bid number 20-014 for curriculum and instructional materials. Item D is considered um, item bid number 20-009 for maintenance, transportation, and miscellaneous supplies. And item E is to consider superintendent's recommendations for personnel. I think uh, Dr. Gomez had one uh, in our board packet, and we didn't have any at our places this evening, so uh, there's just one uh, new hiree there. So those are items A through E. I would remind uh, those in the, that might be watching this or, or those that are uh, here with us in person that we discussed all these items in our uh, pre-agenda board workshop last week. Questions or comments from our board team? Public comment? If not all in favor of our motion, please consider, please uh, indicate by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Our motion passes. Our next item is item nine, consider bills and accounts and financial statements for the month of December 2020. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion from Mr. Dental and a second from Mr. Gallegos. 
to approve our bills and accounts and financial statements for the month of December 2020. Any board comment or questions? Mr. Lehman, as you mentioned earlier, that all these reports have been uh, reviewed earlier in our pre-agenda meeting last week. In addition to that, all these reports can be found online on our website, saist.org. Thanks, Mr. Dindo. Any public comment concerning our motion? If not, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Our motion passes. Our next item is item 10. Uh, Dr. McFarland's going to get us started on considering our approval of the 2019-2020 audit report. And when, I know we have Mr. Stevens here as well, so thank you for being here and for your patience. Uh, yes, Dr. Sir, Mr. McFarland. Layman, Dr. Detloff, members of the board, we've had our audit completed for the 2019-20 fiscal year. Um, you've had copies of that here for um, a few days along with the uh, management's letter uh, that was presented to you. I'm going to introduce Jeremy Stevens, who is here uh, on behalf of Edie Bailey as uh, the lead auditor and uh, who took up uh, the head and lead on uh, the district's audit for this year, and he has some the information to present. Thank you very much. Good evening, members of the board. I'm uh, Jeremy Stevens with Ide Bailey, uh, and our firm has completed the audit of the financial statements for the district for the year ended August 31st, 2020. Uh, I believe a copy of those financial statements were provided to you earlier. I have a brief presentation to go over some of the financial highlights. Uh, feel free to follow along either in the presentation or in the copy of the financial statements if you have them. Uh, before I get into it, though, I do I want to say I think the audit went very well this year. Uh, we did not uh, identify any adjusting journal entries as a result of audit procedures. Uh, additionally, we are not reporting any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. Controls. So overall, just a good, clean audit year. <clears throat> so that being said, see the presentation. Uh, beginning with our independent auditor's report, it starts on page number nine uh, of the bound copy, and then it goes on through page number 11. I'll summarize the main points on the slide. Uh, first of all, uh, our report does indicate that management is responsible for preparation and fair presentation of these financial statements uh, with generally accepted accounting principles. Additionally, management is responsible for the design and implementation of internal controls. Uh, our report then goes on to describe our responsibility as auditor. Uh, as auditor, our responsibility is to express an opinion uh, as to whether these financial statements are presented in accordance with generally accepted principles. Uh, additionally, there's a narrative in there regarding our approach to internal controls, uh, which is that we gain an understanding of the district's internal controls, design our audit procedures. However, we do not test those internal controls to the extent that allows us to express an opinion on so we're not expressing an opinion on the effectiveness of internal controls. And lastly is our opinion found at the top of page number 10. Uh, basically states that in our opinion, these financial statements present fairly in all material respects the financial position. So once again, this is an unmodified opinion uh, over the financial statements or a clean audit reports. Now, moving on to some of the basic financial statements themselves, uh, if you're following along in the board or in the bound copy, it starts on page number 20, uh, is the first statement that I'll touch on, uh, which is the statement of net position. And this particular statement provides a snapshot of all assets and liabilities uh, of the district as of August 31st, 2020. Uh, on the slide, I have a very condensed version of that statement. I don't have any of the detail of the assets or liabilities or anything. Uh, but I do have a comparative column for 2019 uh, on, the, on the slide. Uh, you'll note uh, at end of fiscal year 2020, uh, total assets of the district were about $298 million. Uh, in the previous fiscal year, total assets were about $292. Uh, so total assets did increase year over year by about $6 million. Uh, largely what was driving that was kind of an increase in amounts that were due from other governments, uh, primarily the state of Texas. Uh, as far as uh, liabilities of the district, total liabilities of the district at year end, about $238 million. Uh, previous fiscal year is about $229. So total liabilities did increase uh, year over year uh, by about $8 million. Uh, largely, any, any increases in the liabilities were related to the net pension liability and the net other post-employment benefit liability, uh, and then related deferred inflows with 
Uh, if you add it up, your assets, less your liabilities at year end. August 31st, 2020, you get a net position at year end, approximately $60 million. Uh, previous fiscal year is about 62. The next statement that I'll touch on is the balance sheet of governmental funds. Uh, and this particular statement is found on page number 24 uh, of the bound copy. Uh, again, this particular statement provides a snapshot of assets and liabilities of the district. Uh, however, this particular statement is presented uh, on what is known as the modified accrual basis of accounting. So its focus is on current assets and current liabilities. Uh, there are no uh, fixed assets, no property plant and equipment is on here. Additionally, there are no long-term liabilities. So any liabilities for bonds payable or the net pension liability or the net OPEB liability, those are excluded. These are the district's current obligations and then its resources to meet those obligations. Uh, under this basis of accounting at fiscal year end, August 31st, 2020, you'll see total assets uh, approximately $59.5 million. In the previous fiscal year is about uh, $56.9 million. Uh, so total assets did increase year over year by about $2.6 million. Largest asset category of the district uh, is cash and investments. Uh, at August 31st, 2020, cash and investments is approximately $40 million. Uh, previous fiscal year is about $43 million. So there was a little bit of a reduction in cash and investments. But you'll see that was offset by that increase in receivables. Receivables are your property taxes, receivable amounts due from the state of Texas and so forth. You'll see at August 31st, 2020, those are up to about $13.5 million. Uh, previous fiscal year, those are up. That's kind of what uh, offset that reduction in cash. As far as liabilities uh, for the district, uh, about $16 million in the current fiscal year is about $12 million previous fiscal year. Uh, so total liabilities did increase a little bit, about, about $4 million. Uh, if you added up your assets, less your liabilities, uh, for this particular statement, you get a fund balance at fiscal year end, uh, approximately $43.5 million uh, previous fiscal year. Total fund balance across all funds uh, was about 44 point. Uh, now this slide I've included to illustrate the, the difference in the total fund balance across all funds year over year. Uh, it's divided out to, uh, across different categories. You know, you have non-spendable, restricted, permitted, and so forth. Uh, you'll see the total fund balance, again, that $43.5 million, uh, which was a, a total decrease of about 1.3 million in comparison to last year. If you divide it up against the, the funds, uh, the general fund actually had an increase in total fund balance, about 746,000 increase in the general fund, uh, and then all other governmental funds had a decrease in fund balance of about $2 million. And this slide specifically breaks out just the fund balance of the general fund that I referenced earlier. The total fund balance in the general fund at year end, uh, approximately $38 million. Uh, previous fiscal year is about that $37.2 million. So, like I said, it was about a $746,000 increase. Uh, if you look at the various categories uh, of the general fund fund balance, uh, you'll see that the committed fund balance decreased year over year. It's about $9.6 million in the committed fund balance in the previous fiscal year. Uh, and those were amounts that were committed for construction or for capital improvements. Those were spent down, so that did not were not committed at August 31st, 2020. Uh, unassigned fund balance for the current fiscal year, uh, that's basically the amount available to the district fund kind of regular operating activities. Uh, it increased up to about 35.4 this year. Uh, and one metric that you can use to gauge the health of that unassigned fund balance is to compare it to the average monthly expenditures in the general fund. I did that calculation for the district using that August 31st, 2020 balance and the fiscal year in 2020 expenditures in the general fund, uh, I calculated out that it was approximately 3.3 times the average monthly general fund expenditures. Generally, what I hear recommended is that you keep minimum reserve in unassigned fund balance two to three times the average monthly general fund expenditures. And the last statement that I will touch on is the statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in fund balance. That's on page number 26 basically the income statement of the district. Uh, again, I've got it summarized up on the slide. Uh, this first slide summarizes revenue sources of the district. You see total revenues of the district for the 2020 fiscal year were approximately $155 million. Previous fiscal year is approximately $143 million. Total revenues did increase year over year, almost $12 million. Uh, if you look at the individual sources, 
most of the increases in state revenues, and that's due to the way the, the state allotment was, the calculation was changed during the 2020 year, so that drove that number up. Uh, that was offset by a little bit of a reduction in the federal program revenues, uh, which was due to the reduced funding in the Head Start program. And lastly, as far as expenditures of the district, uh, current year uh, expenditures of the district, about $157 million. Uh, previous fiscal year is about $145 million. Uh, total expenditures increased also year over year, uh, about $11.7 million. If you look at the individual categories, you'll see the largest uh, increase in expenditures is in the capital outlay account spent on construction during the year uh, or other uh, capital expenditures. But capital outlay for the district in the current fiscal year is about $11 million. Uh, previous fiscal year is about $1.2 That's kind of where the bulk of the increase was at. Was in that first of the property. Uh, largest expenditure category of the district is instruction expenditures, about $78.5 million in the current year. Uh, in comparison to total district expenditures, uh, exclusive of capital outlay, because those capital outlay operating expenditures, so I exclude those. But uh, instruction expenditures in relation to total expenditures, uh, approximately 53% uh, Actually, sorry, 54%. It was about 53% last year. That's it for the basic financial statements. There's two other reports that we're issuing in the back uh, that I'll touch on very briefly. Uh, first is on page number 120, uh, following in the bound copy. Uh, this, this report is our uh, report on internal controls over financial reporting and compliance. Again, it reiterates that we're not expressing an opinion on the effectiveness of internal controls. Uh, if we did report any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in internal controls, those would be reported here. Again, happy to report that there are no such items. Uh, additionally, we did not report any instances of non-compliance. And lastly is our report on compliance required by the uniform guidance. That's on page number 122. Uh, and these are our single audit reports. Uh, each year as, our, as part of our audit, we perform a single audit, uh, whereby we select a federal program of the district that's determined to be a major program based on various selection criteria. And then we perform tests uh, of that program so that we can express an opinion as to whether the district complied with the requirements of it. For the current fiscal year, the major programs that we tested were the Title I Part A program uh, and the Special Education Cluster. Uh, our opinion for those is found at the bottom of page number 122. Basically states, that in our opinion, the district did comply uh, with the requirements of those programs. Again, this is an, an unmodified or a clean opinion on compliance with respect to those major programs. I believe that was everything I had prepared. Uh, I did want to just briefly uh, commend the personnel of the district. I know 2020 was not anybody's favorite year by any means. And I think everybody figured out how to do everything differently this year. The audit was no exception. We performed the audit in a remote environment so that we could keep our personnel safe and keep segregated from your personnel. But your, your personnel did a great job getting everything to us, passing documentation through us through the secure portal that we utilize. But they really did help the audit go quite smooth. Uh, that. Any questions for me? Thanks, Mr. Stevens. Questions for Jeremy? Mr. Stevens, first, thank you for your <clears throat> diligence and uh, your staff in uh, auditing our books and making sure that uh, we're as correct as we can get. And then the last question I would have is, is there a better opinion than unmodified? Uh, as far as opinions go, that's the top one. So. You know, accounting, they like to use a lot of CYA, I guess, yes, language, sir. legalese or whatnot. Uh, but uh, unmodified is about as, as, as close, as, we, as high as we can. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Thanks, Bill. I, I knew that question would come from someone with an accounting degree <laughs> like Bill. Other questions or comments? Lots of great information in here, as usual, in the, especially in the statistical part of it in the back. Um, information about who our largest uh, property owners are and who our largest taxpayers are. And uh, so that, that's good information. And how, how we compare to um, last year and other years as far as our percentage of debt versus our, our uh, tax collections. Uh, so all that's really good information. So um, I'd encourage our board members to review that and, 
And if we have any questions, we can get with you at any time, I'm sure. Yes, sir, feel free to reach out to me directly at, at any time. Okay. Okay, thank you so much for that report. Thank you very much. Mr. So, Lehman, there's one thing I was going to say. I know, not for you, you're good. For people watching at home, you know, our, our fund balance this year has gotten a little higher, and I just, as far as unassigned, and I just want to point out to everyone if they're looking at home and stuff, that's because of the uncertainty we had going into this year, not knowing what was going to happen, et cetera. So we've purposely held that money back. We don't want to sit on taxpayers' money, but we also don't want to be um, caught with our pants down. Absolutely. Yeah, but thanks, Dr. Kingman. And, and I know um, I'm, we can mention, and I think Jeremy mentioned this, we spent almost $11 million in capital expenditures last year as part of our fund balance. Um, net investment in capital assets increased by almost $8 million uh, construction projects that we completed last year. So um, we finished a lot of projects, and exactly like Taylor mentioned, we, our intent was to get started this year and make sure uh, that we had uh, funding uh, necessary to, um, to take care of our students and not spend as much money as we've historically spent. But uh, I would remind not only people who are watching this, but members of our board team, that we've spent a significant amount of money over the last uh, five to six years maintaining uh, the facilities that we have, and in, uh, as well as new projects that we've, uh, we've chosen to tackle. So uh, thanks for that comment, Taylor. Other questions or comments? If not, uh, I'll entertain a motion for us to approve the 2019-2020 audit report. Second. So we have a motion from Mr. Dindo and a second uh, from Dr. Um, Kingman. Any other questions or comments from our board team? If not all in favor of our motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed indicate by saying no. Our motion passes. Our next item is item 11 to consider uh, 2021 uh, trustee election for single member districts 1, 2, 3, and 4. Dr. McFarland. Yes, sir, Mr. Layman, and what you have before you tonight with this uh, particular agenda item is that every two years the district, um, along with the city of San Angelo, um, hosts a joint election for um, elect school trustees and city officials. Um, the same polling places, the locations are used. The, the city, San Angelo ISD, and other entities count, uh, contract with Tom Green County administra elections administrator in order to to come to agreement on a joint uh, election process. This is for election um, dated May 1st, 2021, coming up in May uh, for four uh, single member district seats. Uh, seats or district members one, two, three, and four are up for um, election this year to fill four year terms for the Board of Trustees. And so attached to what you have there in front of you as part of your packet are the order of election that um, you'll be asked to, to Call the, and execute the order of election as, as well as the interlocal agreement uh, for the joint election and uh, the election services contract and resolution that goes along with. It. Any questions? Thanks, Dr. McFarland. Questions from anyone? There's also some uh, dates as to important dates for when people file and when the last date to file, and, and, and it's a considerable amount of other information included in that. Other questions or comments? If not, um, we will. Do we um, I'll entertain a motion to consider our 2021 trustee election? I'll make a motion to call the school trustee election for May 1st, 2021. Exec execute the order of election, the interlocal agreement for joint election, the election services contract, and the resolutions. Thanks. Second. Okay. So we have a motion from Mr. Gallegos and a second from Mr. Parker. Any further board comment or questions? Any public comment? If not, all in favor of our motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Our motion passes. Um, we're going to have a closed session this evening. Item 12 um, is to... Uh, consider superintendent evaluation contract and salary. We're able to done, do that under Texas Government Code uh, 551-074 to discuss personnel matters. Um, so we'll...
do that. Before we leave, I'll uh, make sure that we cover our announcements. Our finance and pre-agenda board workshop is on Monday, February the 8th, um, 2021 at 5.45 p.m. And our regular board meeting uh, next month is on another Tuesday, Tuesday, February 16th uh, at 5.45 p.m. So we'll go into closed session again under government code 5510074. Okay, I think we got enough back to finish our meeting. Um, we just left our closed session at which we worked on our superintendent's evaluation contract and salary. That's, uh, and then we'll report that we're in progress on that and we'll um, make sure we keep Dr. Detloff informed on how we're progressing with that. But our, our goal is to have that done in February. So we moved it up a whole month from where we've previously done it. So uh, we'll do that. And uh, I don't think we have any other board business unless somebody has something we need to put on our future agenda. And here, no objection, we'll stand adjourned.